Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs, most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All of us. So individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to return to Virginia to meet a lot of friends and colleagues, see a lot of old faces and some new faces, and share with you this area that I've been involved with. A lot of it has been, as it would be, luck and serendipity to sort of work on the right thing at the right time that turned out to be important. And it's been absolutely marvelous and exciting to see all this move forward. I tell people that most scientists do not have an opportunity to see their fundamental basic research have such an impact in clinical medicine. And uh, it's very exciting to see that happen. And I'm going to try to convince all of you that this field has really got so much more to contribute to patient care in the future. Let me tell you a little bit about my research and why I got the prize, having worked on a problem that turned out to be very important. I knew it was interesting. I thought it would be important. I hoped it would be important, but I didn't realize how important at the time. I grew up as an MD, PhD student in Sutherland's laboratory in Cleveland, working with Earl Sutherland, Ted Rawl. Became very interested in cell communication, how cells talked with hormones and second messenger systems. And when I finished my training, I came here to Virginia for my first faculty position from NIH. And as a young faculty member, I was concerned about being productive, competitive, successful. And I saw the cyclic AMP field growing furiously with lots of people in big laboratories. And I didn't know how I was going to compete with these big operations. And about this time, cyclic GMP emerged as another potential intracellular second messenger. So I switched gears from one second messenger to another. And that turned out to be obviously very important. We tried to decide how hormones and drugs regulated cyclic GMP production and what functions it had in cells. Is it to a messenger or not? Our first publication with nitric oxide biology to activate guanolate cyclase and cause smooth muscle relaxation was in 1977. Today, 28 years later, there are 70,000 to 80,000 publications in the field of nitric oxide research. It's incredible. I would have never dreamed that. And there are very few areas of biology that it does not impact. Almost any system you think of, I would bet that it's going to influence it one way or another. And that makes it exciting. You'd say, well, how can it be specific now for drug discovery and development? Well, that's just clever chemistry and drug delivery systems and 
pharmacokinetics. And those, there are tricks for all of that. But the important thing is to understand all the detailed pathways, and then you've identified molecular targets in which to design drugs and manipulate those pathways. These cells are going to talk to each other. They're going to communicate with each other. And they do it by producing molecules. We call those molecules first messengers or hormones or autocoids or growth factors and cytokines. We give it all sorts of names. But basically what they do is permit communication between cells where these molecules, we call them ligands, are recognized in a target cell by the presence of an appropriate receptor in the surface of that target cell. It's that key and lock fit or the hand in the glove that produces the specificity of that communication. And when those molecules plug into the right receptors in these cells, a biochemical cascade ensues, permitting various intracellular messengers to accumulate that then do what the hormone instructs the cell to do, to regulate some physiologic or biochemical process through these second messengers. The first such second messenger was cyclic AMP, discovered by Rollins Sutherland. Sutherland got the Nobel Prize in 1971 for that discovery. We know today that there are other second messengers, cyclic GMP, calcium, diacylglycerol, some peptides, eicosanoids, and nitric oxide. What is unique about nitric oxide as a messenger is that it's a gas, it's a free radical with an unshared electron, it's very permeable in the lipid bilayer so it can go wherever it wants does have a short half-life because it's reactive as a free radical. But not only does it function intracellularly as a messenger, it can leave the cell and govern the activity of adjacent cells or even distant cells. It's a unique molecule. It's the only messenger that is uncharged at physiologic pH. Therefore, it doesn't need transporters and carriers. It can go where it wants, which makes it unique. When we discovered that a free radical could activate guanolate cyclase, a lot of people thought that was heresy. Free radicals are not supposed to activate enzymes. That's just unheard of. And then I propose that not only does it activate guanolate cyclase, it's probably a second messenger inside of cells to mediate a lot of hormone effects. Now, that was real heresy. Uh, and it was not a popular notion. But fortunately, we were right. And it took us a long time to prove all of that, but we were right. It's a free radical with an unshared electron. It became popular about 50 years ago when it was recognized that fossil fuels or anything combustible that possesses nitrogen, when it's combusted with oxygen, will generate a family of nitrogen oxides. So they come out of automobile exhaust, cigarette smoke, smokestacks. These nitric oxides, the nitrogen oxides, a variety of valencies, so they're families of these molecules, are important because they interact with ozone and deplete the ozone layer therefore removing the ultraviolet filter that permits global warming. That's why it was interesting. And we come along all of a sudden, years later, and say, my God, this pollutant in gas is not only toxic, but it's an activator and a messenger in the body, and it does lots of other things. And uh, it took a while to convince people of that, but finally they came around. We recognized that it was uh, the way some important drugs worked, nitroglycerin, which helped make Alfred Nobel, famous and wealthy. He figured out how to formulate nitroglycerin with a diatomaceous earth in his factories to make it less explosive. Nevertheless, he had a number of explosions in his factories, one of which killed his brother, Emil. But he made dynamite. He became a rich man, blowing up mountains and tunnels and railroad passes and whatever. And he also invented the fuse and detonator for dynamite. He had numerous patents as a chemical engineer, a very clever fellow. These are some of the processes that it regulates. I'm going to skip through that. I'm going to show you some more in a moment. We know in these second messenger systems what happens invariably is a ligand, a hormone, a first messenger, whatever you want to call it, enhances the production of an intracellular second messenger, whether it's cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, diacylglycerol, some lipid, uh, all sorts of intracellular second messengers. These accumulate, and they're going to do the business for the messenger. 
they're going to transmit inside of the cell what it needs to do without the hormone having to get inside the cell necessarily. And very often they activate various protein kinases that phosphorylate protein substrates. And when these protein substrates are phosphorylated, whether it's structural proteins or enzymes, their shape, their conformation, their motility, their enzymatic activity changes. It can be activated or inhibited. That's fundamentally it. There are also families of enzymes that hydrolyze and, and inactivate these messengers, the phosphodiesterases. Today we know there are probably about seven or eight different isoforms of guanylate cyclase, different gene products. We purified them, we've cloned them, we manipulate them, we know their promoters, we know the genomic structure, we make mutants, we make knockout mice and all that sort of stuff. There are about 10 or 11 phosphodiesterases that either hydrolyze cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP. The one you're all familiar with is, is the type 5 phosphodiesterase. Why is that one important? That one's found predominantly in blood vessels, including the blood vessels in the corpus cavernosum of the penis. That's the target for Viagra. You inhibit that enzyme, you potentiate the endogenous nitric oxide released from the nerve terminals in the corpus cavernosum. You make a lot more cyclic G, it accumulates and it relaxes the blood vessels, so they engorge with blood and that's the mechanism of erection. We used to have wisecracks in the laboratory about filling condoms with inote donors and phosphodiesterase inhibitors and other goodies. It was a wisecrack, a joke. I wish the hell I had patented it. <laughs> we didn't bother at the time. But anyway, it's a fun system because they're complicated systems. Lots of players, lots of isoforms, different compartments. So while it appears simple, there's much more to it in this complicated matrix. I mean, there are 150 different protein kinases that phosphorylate a variety of different proteins. As we were looking at guanylate cyclase and its regulation, trying to figure out how hormones regulated it, we accidentally found some simple molecules activating it. I'm not going to tell you why we did those experiments. But we found that azide, hydroxylamine, and sodium nitrite would activate the enzyme. We began to use those activators as surrogate replacements for hormones in tissues. They would activate when hormones wouldn't in cell-free systems. They would also elevate cyclic GMP levels in intact cells, cell cultures and slices, brain slices, liver slices, etc. And we learned that a variety of compounds would do the same thing. Not only azide, hydroxylamine, sodium nitrite, but nitroglycerin would do it because it too relaxed smooth muscle. Nitroprusside, another very important cardiovascular drug we use in intensive care units to lower blood pressure and relieve the workload on the left heart after myocardial infarction. And other NO donors. These are all prodrugs or precursors of nitric oxide. Why did we suspect nitric oxide is the intermediate? Because we knew that some tissues possessed inhibitors of this pathway. We purified those inhibitors. They turned out to be hemoglobin and myoglobin. And we knew from the literature that nitric oxide had a very high affinity for the heme moiety of hemoglobin. And we said, voila, the intermediate for all of these nitrovasodilators, which is what we call them, has got to be nitric oxide. We generate nitric, nitric oxide gas in a fume hood over in the medical school building, and I'll be darned if we didn't activate the enzyme. And that was an exciting moment. Uh, that was the Eureka. That experiment was done late at night by a Japanese fellow who got on an airplane the next day to go home. Incredible. <laughs> he could have just as well gone home and packed his bags, but he wanted to get that experiment done before he returned to Japan. And uh, it was a very exciting time. He was so important to this field that I invited him as well as another four or five trainees to go with me to Stockholm. Uh, Carol and I took 51 people to Stockholm. I spent an awful lot of money <laughs> of the prize to get our family, our five kids, their spouses, grandkids, uh, and some others over there. It was exciting. Wonder wonderful party. It goes on for nine or ten days. I don't, didn't get more than three or four hours of sleep for nine or ten days. Uh, but dances and parties by the medical school and beautiful young students. It was fun. <laughs> dinner with the king and queen. So this is how we put the story together. Some years ago, 
We now know that nitric oxide is a very important molecule in vascular biology. It's produced by the endothelial lining under the influence of various vasodilators and hormones. It's produced in lots of other tissues. We have worked out the detailed biochemistry of all of this that permits us now to identify molecular targets to develop drugs, to figure out how they're working as vasodilators, or to inhibit vasodilatation, or to elevate blood pressure, reduce blood pressure, influence cardiac output, all these things. It's obvious once you know the pieces. The enzymes in the body that make nitric oxide are called nitric oxide synthases. We've purified all of these, as have some other laboratories. They're very complicated enzymes. They've got a very complicated cofactor requirement. What they do is they oxidize the guanidino nitrogen of L-arginine, an essential amino acid in our diet. They oxidize that terminal nitrogen to a hydroxy arginine that is further oxidized to nitric oxide and citrulline. The cofactors involved include oxygen, NADPH, flavines, a heme prosthetic group, tetrahydrobiopterin, reduced biopterin. Why are those important? Turns out there are some very important diseases in which you don't make sufficient quantities of nitric oxide. We call those diseases endothelial dysfunction, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, tobacco use, atherosclerosis. You don't make enough NO for various reasons. And I'll summarize some of that for you in a moment. This is a scheme that sort of helps us design experiments. We now know that a variety of hormones and ligands interact with their appropriate receptors to influence the activity of nitric oxide synthases to make NO from L-arginine. And it does it by manipulating the concentrations of various cofactors in the oxidized or reduced state or availability of calcium, calmodulin, et cetera. The nitric oxide, which we also call endothelial derived relaxant factor, discovered by Furchgott, it's all the same molecule, activates guanylate cyclase to make cyclic G, which activates the kinase to phosphorylate families of proteins to give you a function. That function can be a lot of different things. And we can manipulate this pathway now with receptor agonists and antagonists by changing the availability of cofactors, by slipping in genes to modify these players, by throwing in compounds that are inhibitors of nitric oxide synthase at the catalytic site, by throwing in molecules to suck up and scavenge nitric oxide, by throwing in activators and inhibitors of guanylate cyclase or protein kinase or phosphodiesterase. All of those are potential targets now to discover drugs. It's pretty easy to discover drugs once you know all the pathways. It's not so complicated. And why Big Pharma isn't more successful, I don't understand. Our success rate when I was at Abbott was remarkable. We only had a couple failures. It doesn't have to be 80 and 10% you know, successes. It can be 80 and 90% if you really think through the project and problem carefully. There are other participants in nitric oxide biology. It can do other things. It not only activates guanylate cyclase, but it can be oxidized to nitrite and nitrate, which are inactive, but they're markers of NO production. So by measuring it in blood and urine, you can tell basically how much nitric oxide you're making in various disease states. The nitric oxide likes to interact with other transition metals besides iron. It also likes to react with thiol groups and proteins and cysteine residues. And it nitrosates those cysteines, 150 different proteins so far, they get nitrosated on the thiol groups to make nitrosothiols. Some are transcription factors, some are receptors, some are caspases, play a role in apoptosis. A lot of interesting possibilities, and those are reversible reactions. And another very important reaction is the interaction of the nitric oxide free radical with the superoxide anion free radical. In any situation of inflammation, whether it's Alzheimer's or myocarditis or colitis or nephritis or arthritis, or atherosclerosis, I don't care what your model of inflammation is. There's evidence that you're making a lot of NO and a lot of superoxide, which results in the production of peroxynitrite. It's almost a diffusion-limited reaction.
that sucks up the NO and prevents its activation of cyclase. So the beneficial effects of NO are to make cyclic G. The adverse effects of NO are to combine with superoxide and make peroxynitrite and screw up proteins. Yeah, so we do lots of 2D gels and plucking off spots and mass spec to identify those proteins and how they're modified. I think if we understand this pathway, we'll come up with whole new approaches to anti-inflammatory therapy. If these are really causal and in inflammation, and we can figure out how to stop it or reverse it, we'll have new approaches. We won't have to worry about COX-2 inhibitors and all their problems. This is endothelial dysfunction that I mentioned. The, the bottom line is that under all of these conditions, there's oxidative stress, enhanced production of reactive oxygen species. Therefore, oxidation of the cofactors required both for the metabolism of asymmetric dimethyl arginine, which is a competitive inhibitor of this enzyme, as well as depletion of the cofactors required for nitric oxide synthase. You don't make enough NO. So how do you treat these diseases? Well, you treat the underlying disease, whether it's atherosclerosis or diabetes or cigarette smoking or whatever. But there are other ways to approach it as well with regard to nutritional supplementation, perhaps. L-arginine supplementation. Antioxidants in the way of vitamins. Turns out most people are probably depleted. They don't probably have enough vitamin E and all these other goodies. So there are ways to, to supplement therapy and enhance improvement. And it's been shown, and certainly animals and humans, that these things improve vascular function and integrity with endothelial-dependent relaxation. There are lots of potential applications now for this whole field. You can imagine with 80,000 publications, you can almost go in any direction you want for clinical utility of this information. We know that nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter. There are nerves in the brain, the GI tract, the penis, that liberate nitric oxide as the neurotransmitter. We know also that nitric oxide participates in the size of an infarct in the brain. If you knock out NOS1 in a mouse and look at a stroke model, they have a smaller area of infarct. If you knock out NOS3, they have a bigger area of infarct. That sort of fits with what you might expect. It plays a role in fluid accumulation and production and reabsorption in the eye and glaucoma. It's responsible for retinal ganglia cell degeneration and elevated eye pressures. We talked about vasodilatation, blood flow, blood pressure. A fun one has been pulmonary hypertension. Children, babies, when they're premature, retain their fetal circulation. The fetal circulation is that the they don't need to oxygenate their lungs because the placenta in mother's blood supply provides the oxygen supply, okay? So when they're born prematurely, their lungs are vasoconstricted, they don't have enough surfactant, they're not making enough nitric oxide, they don't want to vasodilate those blood vessels. So the blood supply goes through the foramen ovale and out the ductus arteriosus and it becomes unsaturated, unoxygenated in the arterial circuit. They're blue babies. If you give them inhaled nitric oxide by nasal catheter at very low concentrations, you dilate the pulmonary vessels. They no longer have pulmonary hypertension. They now perfuse their lungs. They oxygenate their blood, and they won't no longer shunt right to left, and their hypoxia improves. And you don't have to put them on these horrible ECMO devices, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation devices where you stick catheters in their carotids and it's pretty devastating. Many of those babies end up getting strokes and so forth. So that's been fun to watch that. That's been exciting. A lot more interesting, I think, than Viagra, <laughs> which I think is trivial science. Um, it plays a role in wound healing and angiogenesis, atherosclerosis. The list goes on and on and on. Here are some other things to look at. The production of nitric oxide and its induction of NOS2 by endotoxin and pro-inflammatory cytokines is a defense mechanism for infections. If an insect bites a plant, they induce nitric oxide production to heal that wound and kill the bugs invading through that stalk. 
people do the same thing. The endotoxin in pro-inflammatory cytokines induce NOS2. You make a lot of NO. It kills the invading organism. It's a self-defense mechanism to our infection. The problem is, is you make so much NO, most of your blood vessels overdilate. You pool your blood, your blood pressure drops, and we call it septic shock. The mortality rate for septic shock in intensive care units is about 70%. Pretty serious stuff. If you inhibit the NOS2 in those patients, you can enhance their blood pressure and hopefully improve their recovery. The same is true also in cardiogenic shock. So there are lots of applications. It, we're not over the hurdle because we need very selective compounds to inhibit the right nitric oxide synthase in the right place. So we're not through with all the medicinal chemistry and everything else that needs to be done in these areas. Gene regulation. For microarrays, we know there are lots and lots of genes regulated by nitric oxide, up and down and sideways. And it's been fun to do some of that. We're about to put our first paper together. Another area that's been very exciting is this potential application in stem cell biology. A few years ago, we decided to take mouse and human embryonic stem cells in the laboratory in culture and see if we can influence their growth rates and differentiation into various cell types by manipulating nitric oxide and cyclic G. And it looks very encouraging and very promising. I hope someday that we're going to be able to create a cocktail to influence stem cell proliferation, differentiation into glial cells or neuronal cells or myocardial cells, and that we won't need stem cells for treatment. All we'll have to do is give the right cocktail to patients and recruit their own stem cells to make the right cell type. Now that's pretty wishful thinking. That's 30 years off on the horizon, but the young people look back and remember I told you that was going to happen. <laughs> but that's what makes science fun, is to think about crazy things and go chase them and get those answers before anybody else. It's really exciting.